Hello everyone, in this episode I'm going to talk about War of Attrition game. There are different versions, some are in continuous time, some in discrete time. Uh, well, what about the sort of the, uh, the, the structure of the game? We use War of Attrition games in some very interesting problems. Um, like international conflicts or patent raids and some interesting uh, uh, competitions between firms. So here is one simple example in discrete time. So there are two players, they are competing uh, with each other over a prize. The prize is not uh, divisible, so there's going to be only one winner, at most one winner, and the winner gets the prize. Uh, V1 and V2 are how much player 1 and 2 attaches to the value. I mean, you know, what is the value of this prize for player 1 and player 2? So those are the parameters that basically answers that question. I assume that these are some positive numbers, and in fact they are positive than the, I mean, I'm sorry, greater than the, the costs, and I will talk about the costs in a minute. Well, the game uh, is an infinite horizon. It starts from time zero, goes up to infinity, meaning it never stops, potentially. And at any given time, players simultaneously and independently choose one of two actions. They either wait or fight, or they drop out, they exit. Okay, that's it. Um, so the strategy space is pretty simple in that sense. At each period, players accumulate some cost. So if you keep fighting, you will actually accumulate cost. And the thing is, well, when does the game end? Well, if at least one of the players drop out, well, then the game will be over. All right, so if player one drops out at some point of time, but player two has not yet dropped out, well, then player two will become the winner and he's going to get the prize. And both of them are going to suffer the cost, obviously. So if it is boxing match, for example, well, I mean, there's going to be bruises and everything. And so whoever sort of, uh, you know, drops out, uh, is going to be the loser, but nevertheless, the pain, the cost you accumulated will be, uh, you know, incorporated into your payoff function anyway. Um, so the question is, who is going to drop first? Um, obviously, uh, an interesting question in many uh, uh, competitive real-life situations as well. Um, as I said, well, uh, one thing maybe, if both players drop out at the same time, uh, there's going to be no winner. Uh, that's kind of a simplification assumption, to be honest. Uh, but other than that, that's all we need to know, I believe. So, let's talk about uh, the payoffs. And here I'm going to define uh, two terms. Uh, I'm going to denote it LT. LT is basically the accumulated uh, cost when player LIT, when I drops out at time T. So when you drop out and in period T you do not suffer cost in that period, but obviously you suffered um, you know, in period 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to t minus 1, okay? So that's your accumulated cost. Obviously, if your opponent dropped in period 0, you never accumulated anything. So therefore, this is the accumulated cost up until period t, given that your opponent did not exit the or, or drop out before this time. So therefore, this is, so in period 1, in period 0, I'm sorry, player i is going to suffer minus ci. In period 2, uh, he's going to suffer ci again, but I'm going to discount it. The reason we want to discount it is because this is potentially an infinite horizon game, and so at infinity, there's going to be, uh, the, the, the total payoff is going to be minus infinity, which is not well defined, and so we would like to bound the payoffs. So for that reason, we discount. Uh, so, uh, I'm sorry, not plus, minus, this is period one, uh, period two, you're going to get delta to the power two, all the way to period uh, t minus one, and don't forget again, in period t, because you're dropping out, you don't uh, suffer any cost. Well, this is nothing but minus ci parenthesis, one plus uh, delta plus delta square plus all the way to delta to the power t minus one. And if you sum this up, you're going to get 
uh, 1 minus delta to the power t divided by 1 minus delta. Okay, so that's that simple to find. I leave it as an exercise if it is not obvious to you. Well, and then I'm going to define hit. Well, what is this? Well, this is the payoff you're going to get if you if your opponent, uh, if player i's opponent uh, drops at time t. All right, so again, you and your opponent did not drop up until t minus one, and in period t, you don't drop, but your opponent does. All right, in this case, this is going to be your payoff. So what is it? Well, you're gonna get minus ci in period zero, minus ci delta in period one, uh, similar to this one all the way, minus ci delta t minus one, right? I mean, you suffered all the way up until period t minus one. Well, what about period t? Well, now, uh, luckily, you don't suffer any cost. The game is over because your opponent exits at time t. And so what's going to happen? You're going to discount it, uh, delta to the power t times your valuation vi, All right, the, because this is the end of the game. So in fact, this is nothing but, uh, so remember this term and this term are the same. So this is lit plus delta to the power t v of i. All right. Well, you'll see how I'm using those payoffs. Uh, so again, the, 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 these are not payoff functions, but we can, the, the, the payoff structure is already given by using this description. We are creating these two terms uh, because later I am going to use these two terms. Uh, and obviously the payoff function itself is complicated because it depends on when the players exit and, and, and also it depends on what the other guys has done and etc. Um, so here's one thing. So let's say player one exits or drops out in period five and player two never drops out. What's going to be the payoff for player two doesn't matter because the game will be over at the period where one of the players has dropped out, okay? So that's, that's important. In this game, um, what are the equilibrium, Nash or subgame perfect Nash? Uh, well, there might be many, but the thing is, if we just look at the Nash equilibrium uh, of this game, uh, there are actually uh, three. So two of them are pure strategy Nash equilibrium and one mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. So um, what are the pure strategy Nash equilibria? Well, they are pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, it basically says one of the player, one of the players is going to drop out immediately and then the other will never drop out. All right, so player one, drops out at time zero, player two never drops out. All right, well, obviously this is just one of the pure strategies. The other one, you just change the name, uh, the names, player uh, two uh, drops out at time zero, and then player one uh, never. Uh, drops out. I think that is pretty straightforward why these are uh, pure, I mean, Nash equilibrium. Well, but nevertheless, let's argue. So let's look at the first one, okay? Player one drops out at t equals zero. Player two never drops out. Let's call this S1 star, S2 star, okay? So this is my strategy profile. What is payoff of player one under uh, S star? And what is payoff of player two under S star? So let's first figure them out and then see if they have profitable deviations. So player one drops out immediately. And so, well, I didn't mention here, but whoever drops out at the beginning of the game, uh, there's no cost. All right, and hence uh, zero payoff, okay? And then, so that's it. What about player two? Well, player two never drops out, but the nice thing is his opponent dropped out at time t equals zero, so therefore he's basically getting h i t equals zero, which means delta to the power zero times v i, uh, v two. So it's just uh, delta to the power zero is one, so it's v two, okay? Um, well, we're very good. Well, the question is, 
Uh, let's look at player two. Player two, does he have any strategy S2, uh, S2, which is going to give him higher payoff than this? Well, um, the answer is pretty straightforward, no, because V2, remember, is the payoff you can get if you, own, sort of, if you get the price and you don't suffer any cost. So whatever strategy you do, it is probably going to reduce the, or your payoff. Well, in fact, whether you exit in period one or period two or period five doesn't matter because the game will be over in period zero thanks to player one's strategy and so your payoff will never be better than v2 but what about player one can player one improve his payoff well remember player two is never uh, uh, dropping out so if player one plays only say 10 periods and then drop out, well, waiting 10 period means nothing because player two is playing a strategy where he will never drop out. So therefore, player one, if he waits 10 periods, he's going to suffer LIT equals 10, which is some negative number, and then he's gonna drop out. So therefore, he's gonna get zero. Well. I'm sorry, he's not going to get zero, he's going to get negative payoff, even worse than this. So there's no way he can get a positive payoff. So the only way he can get positive payoff if he waits as long as his opponent. But remember, his opponent waits forever, so he never exits. So what does that mean? That means uh, you have to also wait forever. But the problem is, if you wait forever, and if my opponent waits forever, Okay, so here we didn't maybe perfectly specify it. So what happens if both players basically play forever? Huh, well, uh, I mean, if you look at those uh, sort of payoffs, it basically means you wait forever and then you are going to drop out. But when at time t equals infinity, there's no such time, right? I know this is a bit fishy part of the game, but what you can assume, all right, just for uh, sake of completeness, if the players, if both players wait forever, they're going to get some negative payoff, which is very, very, very big. Finite, but very big. All right, so, but it's gonna be negative. So therefore, player one has no option or alternative to increase his payoff uh, above zero. So therefore, given player two strategy, player one is actually best responding, and hence, this is a Nash equilibrium strategy. And uh, this one. Symmetrically, this one is also Nash equilibrium strategy. Now, actually, it is a nice example to check why, for example, uh, player, one drops out t equals zero, but player two drops out t equals one. Why is this not Nash equilibrium? Very simple. If you look at these payoffs, right? Zero, V2, right? Player one is dropping out, getting zero payoff. Player two is winning, getting V2 payoff. But the thing is, now player one has incentive to deviate. Why? Well, because he knows that his opponent is going to play strategy where he's going to drop out at t equals 1. So therefore, all he has to do, wait period 0 and period 1, and then drop in period 3. All right? So if he actually waits a little longer than player 2, his opponent, he can win the prize. And so instead of getting 0, he can get some positive payoff, uh, v2 minus... Uh, so V2 uh, is, um, okay, so he is dropping out uh, in period two. So in period zero, he's going to suffer minus C1. Uh, and then in period one, he is waiting, but his opponent is dropping out. And so he's getting delta V2. So the question is, is this positive? All right, well, as long as this is true, all right, which uh, I mean, we didn't specify, but uh, we are going to assume that V2 is large enough. So you can imagine that C1, C2 are actually very, very, very small costs, all right? They're not huge. So as long as those costs are not huge, well, in fact, as you see, uh, this player has profitable deviation, 
all right? And so therefore, this is not Nash equilibrium. So it's a good point. Whether this strategy is in Nash equilibrium or not, again, depends on how big those costs are. And if they are small enough, very small, well, then it actually will be, uh, it may be Nash equilibrium. I'm, I'm sorry. If C's are large enough, uh, those strategies may also be Nash equilibrium. But if they are very, very small, like epsilon, so every period uh, you accumulate some cost, but it's not terribly huge in comparison to delta 2. Or, you know, delta is very large, almost like 1. Well, so in those cases, those strategies are not Nash equilibrium. Right? And hence, we have two Nash equilibrium strategies, impure strategies. What about the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium? 